Our next speaker is David Mendonca. He's a professor of uh, industrial and systems engineering. Uh, he has degrees in English and public policy before industrial engineering. And he studies group and organizational decision making, especially in disaster settings. He's going to talk to us today about collective behavior in queuing networks, the case of post-disaster debris. Thank you. Uh, nice to see so many people here at this hour. I know you're all worried about missing the Brazil game. Uh, I think they're, I think they're going to do just fine without us. Um, I will uh, talk today about uh, one of one of the hidden post-disaster activities, and uh, I'm going to use it as an excuse to uh, talk about the the behavior and the performance of teams in a slightly non-routine environment, which is a, which is a queuing network. Uh, many things make this case interesting. Uh, there's rather a lot of money on the table, first of all. Uh, this is a debris field from southern Mississippi after Katrina. And uh, you know, if you stack up the 10 most expensive disasters in terms of federal funding, uh, they all happened fairly recently. All of them were debris-inducing events. And, and aside from being expensive, some, some of them were really expensive. So you know, Katrina recovery costs were somewhere in the neighborhood of $7 billion. And you know, just over $4 billion of that was spent merely on debris removal. But unless you've spent significant amounts of time, well, until recently, I could say this, unless you spent significant amounts of time below the Mason-Dixon line, probably didn't have to think too much about debris in comparison to you know, fires in high-rise buildings. But uh, since Sandy, there's uh, been considerably more awareness in the, in the Northeast about how to run these operations and how to make them cost-effective. Uh, debris removal has remained uh, stubbornly resistant to uh, technological innovation. I'll just give you a few examples in the Going clockwise from the upper left, that's the Lisbon earthquake of 1755, and then there's Kobe, and then there's World Trade Center on the lower right, and then there's San Francisco earthquake. And these all look you know, pretty much the same if you look at debris removal operations enough. There are some teams with some rudimentary or more advanced equipment, and uh, they are in operation in order to get the debris off of the roadways, perhaps off of private property, so that uh, economic development can continue. They do that, at least in modern schemes, by moving through this particular cycle as fast as they possibly can. So there's a debris removal team on the, up there on the top, and they are loading. Uh, they traverse a road network to what's called a TDSR, a Temporary Debris Storage and Reduction Site where the load is unloaded. Uh, I'm sorry, I've got those two pictures reversed. The, a load is estimated. Uh, that's, uh, that then leads to the payment to the, uh, to the contractor. And then the load is unloaded. The truck then travels back to the team. And again, the, the faster and more effectively you can, you can make that go as a contractor, the more money you get. If you expand that loop, what you eventually find is that none of those loops are, it's rare for those loops to operate independently. The dispatchers who were in charge of the trucks get kind of nervous when it takes a long time to get to or from the TDSR, and so they start rerouting trucks. There are conceivably many, many such uh, loops engaged in, uh, in, uh, in one of these events. Uh, so with, uh, with, that as, with that as a background on debris removal, I hope it's, it's clear enough. Uh, they're large, they're complex. I want to offer two research questions that I will attempt to address in the remainder of this talk. First is to explain the performance of teams, in this case, debris removal teams, in terms of their, their composition. And that specifically refers to the size of the team and the degree of turnover in the team. Uh, under the current incentive structure, okay, status quo incentive structure. And then secondly, via simulation study, explore 
possible effects of alternative incentive structures and, uh, and resource allocation strategies on team and, and network performance. Uh, the, the measures for team composition and team performance, I, I want to discuss those uh, briefly. Again, size is just, we take the trucks, the number of trucks or the trucks of a team as the members of the team. Without them, you can't make the operation go. No matter how great your loaders are, you need trucks. And uh, we have data on them. And then second is uh, the degree of turnover in the team. And these are two, if, if you do group research, you know that these are hard fought measures and, and concepts and highly contested ones, but uh, both firmly grounded in, in the theory of, uh, of team performance. Uh, the, the second measure, which is the, uh, the turnover or, from, or fluidity measure, is really a function of pairwise working history of the, of the trucks on the team. So for, for both of these measures, if, if we want to get you know, traction at, a, at an operational level, we need some fairly detailed data. And, and I'll talk about our data source in, in just a little bit. Second, on the, on the performance side, uh, one of the things that we were interested in doing here was attempting to resolve some contradictory findings on the impact of composition on, on performance. And the, the working hypothesis here is that we need to look at performance in a, in a richer way uh, beyond, beyond effectiveness, not exclusively effectiveness. So uh, we look at it in, in three ways. So first, in terms of effectiveness, and that's the total full load equivalence. There are trucks of different sizes. So th this is really how good you are at using your current carrying capacity. Uh, secondly is the efficiency of those trucks. So that's the output relative to available resources. So that's how many load miles you can haul per day. People get paid for, uh, for hauling over, over different distances. And then second, uh, equality, which refers to the distribution of work in the team. And these three measures are known to have trade-offs between them. So we, we want to make sure that our modeling framework enables us to, to capture uh, those trade-offs. Okay, a couple of uh, working hypotheses, uh, both tied in to the structure of the task at hand. First is that team fl fluidity is expected to decrease effectiveness. And you know, that, that's not what everybody says. Okay, part, of, uh, part of what is happening here, we think, is that this is a, it's a relatively simple task. It's one that uh, when you increase the turnover of the team, you run the risk of doing nothing but riding the low end of the learning curve. That people who will come in new will just have to, they, they will have to adapt themselves. The routines will not adapt to them. And then secondly, increased team size is expect to, expected to increase you know, kind of throughput effectiveness um, and the, the ability to distribute uh, work across team members, but the lower efficiency, and that really has to do with, uh, with coordination, with demands on coordination. Okay. The, uh, the event here of, of interest is a, a series of tornado storms. It, well, one, one tornado storm that passed through uh, much of the state of Alabama in, I guess, 2011. And uh, this was, it was not massive, but it was pretty big, and it was pretty fast, and it was definitely nasty. So 10.5 million cubic yards of debris. Uh, this, went, this mission went on for uh, a few months. There were about 66 debris removal teams deployed in the field on average on a given day with about four trucks per team, uh, 17 drop-off or TDSR sites, and there were about 130,000 total loads delivered. So again, this is not, they, they may seem, I don't know if they seem like big numbers or small numbers, but this is not a, not a huge event, but definitely not, not a small one. Um, Interestingly, it was the first one for which uh, electronic load tickets were used. And uh, this is an accounting artifact, so there's massive potential for corruption, waste, abuse within this system simply because it is so open. Okay, even for this particular event, we're talking about the top two-thirds of the state of Alabama. It's a very open, poor system, and it, very, it would be very expensive to monitor everything. So um, they used to use paper-based tickets. Those were horrible. 
and now they use uh, load tickets. And load tickets are used to keep track of every single load that moves through the system from pickup to drop off and, and back and who's driving the truck and lots and lots and lots of other things. One load, one ticket. About 20, then there are 22, maximum 22 attributes per load. Okay, so the Corps of Engineers was kind enough to uh, give us the, the complete data set and uh, what, what you'll see on this animation is all the loads being, being picked up. I'm not showing the delivery points, but it'll keep on rolling and then it'll stop. Uh, that's when people go home for the weekend and you know, their work slows down or stops at, at night, so this is a weekend. Uh, so we take, we take all that data and uh, we use it to construct our, our study measures. Okay, so, the, so again, the, the results for this first chunk of, of work are, are as follows. First, uh, yeah, fluidity is bad. It's uniformly bad. It's bad for effectiveness. It's bad for efficiency. It's bad, bad for equality. This is something that you know, could be instrumentally controlled by, uh, by policy. And uh, second, while Increased size does indeed help effectiveness. It actually diminishes the quality of the uh, of distribution of, of effort. So there's a bit of a trade-off there between those two dimensions. The the R squared values for you know this kind of beha for behavioral work are kind of high. So this is, suggests we'd like to use more of these kinds of data. Okay, we'd we'd prefer not to have to ask a few thousand contractors questionnaires. Okay. Um, okay, so that's, a, that's the first chunk of work. So this gives us some insights into, uh, into how team performance, team composition shapes team performance absent, uh, s sort of absent what's going on in the rest of the system. How's my time? Great, perfect. Okay, and then we got interested in, you know, okay, what are the dynamics of the system? So we, we fit the same multivariate regression model um, to seven week moving averages of, of the data. And uh, I wanna highlight just two, two series here, which, uh, so this is uh, the results for turnover. So this is the value of the coefficient for the effectiveness dimension with respect to, to turnover. So already, uh, Okay, so initially things are not looking good. Turnover, anything below the dotted line is negative. So there, there's a big chunk of the mission, you know, two thirds of the mission where uh, turnover, you know, really, really hurts you. And then we get uh, a transition where it actually, where it helps later. And, and similarly for uh, the efficiency dimension and, you know, equality is always negative. Uh, for size, it always helps, it's always positive. Uh, efficiency, it kind of fluctuating back and forth, and uh, inequality, um, also negative. Okay, so there are definitely some dynamics going on here, and uh, you know it's important to consider uh, the, the mission dynamics, okay, and uh, and how they how they unfold. Okay, so we uh, we thought to to look at that through the design of a execution of a, of a simulation study. We picked an isolated region of the state of Alabama, so this particular northwest quadrant is, uh, is attractive. We were, it was, this was purely dumb luck. It's run by a single subcontractor. There are two uh, TDSRs and six pickup sites, and we had data for a 10-day 10 10 period, so this is a nice little chunk of data to try some things out. We, considered two different sets of factors. Okay, first is what is the impact of the market context on performance? And then second, what's the impact of essentially dispatcher rationality on performance? Okay, the, the status quo market context, the status quo way of paying these people is to pay them proportional to distance. So it's just you get paid one amount for trucking less than 10 miles and another amount for trucking more than 10 miles. We also introduced two other ones. You get paid the same for no matter what distance you go and then you get paid proportional to the amount of time you spend traversing the road networks. So that's the first set of factors. And then, and then the second one um, the we encapsulated within this dispatcher model, there are two different levels here. One is a more reactive decision maker. That's 
the decision maker who's freaking out a little bit because it's taking too much time, more time than expected for the trucks to get back to the site or get to the TDSR. Okay, so that's high degree of forgetting. In other words, the, the dispatcher is not paying attention to the long run, uh, long run average for travel time. And then less reactive, so low forgetting. Okay, so a, you call it a, a more rational model. Uh, the, the kernel elements of the simulation really is a, a very simple uh, single server bipartite queuing network. Okay, again, it's influenced by, we hypothesize that market conditions are influencing dispatch, dispatcher behavior, and then the dispatcher makes decisions about whether or not to move a truck from one queue to, to another. Okay, that's a simple decision. Um, the remote service rate, in other words, uh, at, the, at the point of pickup, is a function of team composition, and that builds upon the, the prior work. Uh, the parameters, I should say, for the, for the queuing network side of things, those are relatively easy to extract from the, from the data. The dispatcher decision model, uh, it, it's a little bit more complicated. I'll say just a, a little bit about it. So uh, we have a, a decision that can be made for, to, to, de to deploy a truck from one site to, to another site. Um, we have to really consider how to validate this model in, uh, in, in a way other than doing it all at once, okay? And uh, so first was to choose a, a reward structure or choice that maximizes this, uh, this particular log ratio. The, the forgetting factor is derived in a way that in, is derived by maximizing sort of the rationality of of the dispatcher's decision. So we, we, we presume a rational model on the part of the decision maker and, uh, and estimate um, that forgetting factor. And then uh, T, this other, this other parameter, is chosen in order to maximize the likelihood of the observed decisions, okay? Okay, so with a dispatcher model in place and with the structure of the network in place, place with parameters from the actual data, we run the simulation under the different Scenarios. Uh, so first, I want to look at uh, at team performance uh, under the three different pricing strategies. So uh, the results at the team level are not conclusive for these four teams. That's the important first thing to mention. Okay. Sometimes uniform assign uniform pricing strategy is better. Other times time is better. Other times distance is better. Okay. So really depends. Uh, that's the first major observation. The second one is that the level of dispatcher rationality doesn't really have a market impact on, uh, on the performance of the teams, okay? But when you look at the, at the system level, it's rather a different story, okay? Um, the, uh, for the uniform strategy, for example, throughput is higher than for a time-based compensation strategy or, a, I'm sorry, a time-based compensation or a distance-based compensation. In other words, the, the status quo. Um, ignore the dotted lines for a moment. I'll say, about, I'll say something about those in a, in a moment. Uh, in, in terms of price, the, the uniform pricing strategy actually delivers you know, not the lowest cost, but uh, certainly well below the distance-based one, and then compensating with respect to time. Uh, it's considerably more variable, but uh, delivers the overall lowest cost. So this means that uh, if the simulation is right, huh, then the current policy delivers the worst performance at the highest cost. Okay, so that's the main uh, lesson here. Okay, and this is, uh, again, this is based on the uh, more reactive dispatcher model, so the status quo model for the dispatcher. Okay, um, I did say I'd mention these uh, dotted lines here. Uh, in, in separate work, we, we developed optimal policies, and uh, those, those really recalibrate themselves based on the performance of the teams every, every week. So, you know, I don't think that would be a workable policy. In other words, we'd have to deliver a new pricing policy to the subcontractors every week. And I, the, the, these are really tough people. They're strong-minded people. Um, they, sometimes they work for the Department of Sanitation. They, they don't mess around. Okay. 
All right, so a uh, few, uh, few summary points from, uh, from this work. Uh, at, the, at the team level for the second chunk of work, at the team level is really no substantial effect, at least based on the teams that we exampled, examined um, of the rationality of the dispatcher on the effectiveness of the teams and then some inconsistent effects of pricing strategy. So something else is going on at the, at the team level. But at the system level, at least for the status quo dispatcher model, there's a significant effect of pricing strategy uh, even when the, the dispatcher is, is highly reactive, okay? meaning not paying attention to historical trends. And that you know, for sort of practical takeaway here is that the, the results suggest that the current pricing strategy is dominated in terms of performance and cost. Okay? And you know, I'm remembering now this conversation with the Corps of Engineers people, you know, really early on in this research, and I said, well, you know, how did you do on Irene compared to Katrina in terms of the effectiveness of the operation? They said, we have no idea. We don't, we don't have a way of evaluating that. Okay, ongoing and future research. So uh, there are lots of effect, there are lots of uh, disruptive events that can happen during the execution of the, weather, of, of the mission. There's, there's weather, there's accidents machine failures, all kinds of things. So it'd uh, be interesting to see how well the system adapts to those disruptions and what are the factors that underlie an ability to adapt well. Uh, additional trade-off analysis, we worked with trade-offs only at the level of, of team behavior. Um, we also want to do a, take a similar approach at the, at the subcontractor level. Okay. Uh, third, Really important and really tough getting back to the government discussion, you know, providing prescriptive guidance or at least some tools to support. Um, the, uh, the use of the current system enables data on loads to be delivered essentially in real time back to the, to the dispatcher. And, you know, that's obviously both a blessing and a curse in, uh, in this case, but opens the door to uh, real time control of these, of these complex systems. Uh, secondly, I, I said we got lucky with that one region. Well, we also got lucky because they built in a data collection protocol that enabled us post hoc to reconstitute all the teams that we wanted to study. If they, that's, and that's a human-based reporting protocol. If they got rid of that, then you know, we never would have been able to do this work. So it's a very fragile sort of thing. Okay, so uh, informing the design of data collection protocols so that you know, we can do better science on, uh, on how the team and the organization performs is uh, what we'd like to do. Okay, and then the uh, last one, getting back to Sandy, this is current work, it's just considering the case where both the network and the organization that manage it are co-evolving, okay? Not every state in a risk-prone or hurricane-prone area has a plan for doing debris removal, and sometimes they are building the organization to run the job as they're doing the job. Thank you. <laughs>